Good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is Lizzie and Justin, and we are here again, turning towards life. And you are very welcome wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is, whenever you're listening, whatever year, year you're listening. This is 2024, Sunday, the 31st of March. And we're here today with a source chosen by Justin. If you're new, maybe you're new to joining us, we have a source each week and we alternate who chooses the source, either me, Lizzie, or Justin chooses it. And this week, Justin's chosen it. And we begin with the source and then see where the conversation takes us in the wondering, in the reflection of what gets given to us in the in the amazing poems. And this week we've got one by Marie Howe that Justin selected for us and we will read it and then see where the conversation goes. So welcome to you and welcome Justin. Hello as well. Hello Lizzie. Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, <clears throat> it feels very good to be back together, Lizzie, and, and very good to have you all with us. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a couple of things before we get into this poem. Actually, I'm very, I have it in mind very much that at this point in March, the very end of March 2024, there's a lot going on in the third space world. And third space is the, the something that gave birth to this uh, big conversation project that you and I are in, Lizzie. So I just want to say to all of you who are with us, if you have any curiosity about learning together in, in some quite deep and very life-giving ways about, first of all, about being human, and second of all, about coaching one another, uh, supporting other people, head over to wearethirdspace.org because we have our Foundations of Coaching program coming up and our annual professional coaching course is gearing up to a June 2024 start. So um, if you're interested in that at all, that's the place to go. And I think it's worth mentioning because these things these days, they fill up and uh, people sometimes miss out on being with us when they'd like to be with us. And um, that's it. Here's our source for this week. So you can find this always on the turningtowards.life website. You can find it in our Facebook group, which is a lovely place to come and join in the conversation. You can find it in the notes that go out with the various podcast versions and on YouTube. And this is called What the Living Do, and it's by Marie Howe. Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there, and the draino won't work but smells dangerous and the crusty dishes have piled up, waiting for the plumber I still haven't called. This is the everyday we spoke of. It's winter again, the sky's a deep headstrong blue and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag breaking, I've been thinking, this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, I thought it again. And again later, when buying a hairbrush, this is it. Parking, slamming the door shut in the cold. What you called that yearning. What you finally gave up. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not. A letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it. But there are moments walking when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass, say, the window of the corner video store, and I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep for my own blowing hair, chapped face and unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you. Thanks, Justin. What the Living Do by Marie Howe. Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there. And the Drano won't work, but smells dangerous. And the crusty dishes have piled up waiting for the plumber I still haven't called. This is the everyday we spoke of. It's winter again. The sky is a deep, headstrong blue and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag breaking, I've been thinking, this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, I thought it again. 
and again later when buying a hairbrush. This is it. Parking, slamming the door shut in the cold, what you called that yearning, what you finally gave up. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not call, a letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it. But there are moments walking when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass. Say the window of the corner video store and I'm gripped by the cherishing so deep for my own blowing hair, chapped face and unbuttoned coat that I'm speechless. I'm living. I remember you. Lucy. I've been um, <clears throat> sitting on this poem for a long time. I think maybe like you, I've got a, a list somewhere of possible sources for turning towards life. And just the last couple of days before this weekend, as you'll know this, I was leading a two day foundations of coaching program with our very dear friend and colleague Sue for a group of people. And we got in over those two days into talking a little bit about the sort of the tyranny in our culture of uh, self-improvement. You know, that sense somehow that there's a, there's a story, which is not our story, how we, how we think about coaching or I think when we're teaching that body of work, but there's a, there's a sort of tyranny in our culture that somehow two, two things get really muddled up. So the, wouldn't it be good and important to improve the conditions for ourselves and everyone gets muddled up with, I have to be a better and better and better, more perfect person all the time. And they're, they're completely different projects. And it's so easy to imagine that they're very straightforward, um, pain of living that Marie Howe writes about here, you know, when, when we get that our lives are finite and we're going to lose ourselves and we're going to lose other people, which she writes about here so directly and so beautifully. It's, I think it's really easy to get confused that the way to deal with how tender it is to be alive is to somehow embark on some great self-improvement project, you know, like if I make myself shiny and perfect, if I don't have any edges or confusions or, or messiness, if I'm perfectly put together and present a perfect image to myself and to the world, then I'll be freed of all of that difficulty. And so we got talking a bit about how poisonous that story is, that somehow somehow we ought to get we ought to get to the program of self-improvement of of ironing out all of our humanness and then along comes marie howe and says you know what right in the middle of i assume in this poem grieving for johnny who the way i understand this is no longer here right in the middle of that it would be really easy to try and get with the program of you know, hooking ourselves up and getting ourselves together when actually what's really called for is noticing the pile of washing up on the side, um, forgiving ourselves for dropping a bag of groceries in the street, or even just smiling at being somebody who drops a bag of groceries in the street, or even just recognizing that I'm a person who, dro who drops a bag of groceries in the street. And, um, noticing our longing and uh, this invitation, the Zian to cherishing what's here. And somehow this story we have that we ought to always be improving ourselves um, takes us away from something very, very basic and very, very straightforward, which is, oh my goodness, I'm here, I'm living, and what what a something that is, even just to recognize it. And I actually don't want to go down the line of recognizing and then feeling grateful for it or something. I, I don't even want to do that in saying this, like there's some something, some way that a 
a person ought to be. Um, it's brief and it's fleeting and it's precious and it's extraordinary. And sometimes it's filled with great joy and sometimes it's filled mm. with great suffering. Maybe that's the most important thing we can do before the prerequisite to anything else that we choose is to turn towards the preciousness of our lives and then decide, yeah, there's all kinds of things that could be made better here. I'm really with that. I think that I think making the world better is, is uh, really worth attending to. But somehow if we do it as a way of turning away from our lives, as a way of running from the, the very realities of our existence, we're missing something um, sacred that Marie Howe is pointing us into here. I'm sitting in appreciation for the kind of normalisation of drains being blocked and not being able to turn the heating off and breaking a shopping bag and having your buttons all done up wrongly and the the kerfuffleage, like you say, the things that we would probably try and iron out. <laughs> and what the what a relief is that it's all... I have this thing, like, if someone's written a poem about it, it's okay. <laughs> it's like the, the grandest permission to notice that this is itness of life and to not be constantly taken by the narrative of self-improvement or that there's a destination to get to or some place of arrival or something. And honestly, reading this this morning and listening to you really carefully when you were reading Justin and welcoming all of the kerfuffleage of my life. Like I'm sitting here now with you and I can hear my husband, my mother-in-law and my two children trying to get out of the house to leave me in peace for nine o'clock when it's 20 past nine and they've had this 20 minute kerfuffle of how to get out of the house and being a witness to it with you reading that and hearing it out of part of my hearing here there's all kinds of things I could be responding like I could be annoyed I could be laughing at them I could be you know all, all the things and in all of that, I could be missing just how precious it is that they're even getting out the door and doing something and trying to find their shoes and the baby screaming. And it's, it's, th this is it. This is itness is so beautiful that Marie Howe is drawing our attention to. And it's so easy to keep on being annoyed by the washing up or keep on thinking that the, the hair in the drain is the most annoying thing ever. And I'm so grateful just to kind of take a an out breath of like, oh yeah, that's just what life is. That's what it's like when you just done the shopping and the eggs smash in the basket or whatever on the way home. This is this is this is it. So I'm feeling very welcomed and allowed in the messiness of things and the the normal everyday stuff that probably we don't really talk about because it's not particularly remarkable. And yet it is the stuff that our everyday lives are made of. And I'm really grateful that it gets spoken of this way because it is mostly what's here. <laughs> you know, what the living do is this list of things. And I'm I'm just remembering actually, Justin, there's a really sweet video I saw once of Aretha Franklin and people might know just how kind of prolific Aretha Franklin is and what an incredible woman artist person she is, was. And I feel like one of the amazing things that she said in this interview is that the person said to her, listen, what have been the greatest challenges of your life? And of course she could have said, goodness knows how many things, but actually what she said was, well, mainly it's just choosing what to cook for dinner every night. <laughs> and then and then this kind of looseness arrived in the conversation of, of course she's this very, very, very well-known person and done extraordinary things in her life. And still the most challenging thing is what do we cook for dinner every night? And I feel like, whoever we are, whatever kind of shininess we've projected into the world, we're all people who hit print on a printer and the thing eats the paper. 
or something. You know, we're, we're all those people, whatever we're looking like to the world, everybody's got some kind of printer kerfuffle or drain blocked or car parking ticket or some really tricky thing going on in their lives. And so I feel like the demystification of that is also part of undoing the self-improvement narrative because once we know people, once we know ourselves as this messiness, there isn't also a big comparison that happens that sets up the dynamic of self-improvement. If I could just be like her or if I could just be like that or if I could just have this. Once we know more that that this is true of everything, that what the living do is this ordinary, ordinary things, it's much harder to then paste perfection and aim for it or something onto our lives it's lovely hearing about aretha franklin it made me think that um the i'm i'm really glad that marie howe didn't just make this a poem about blowing hair chat face and unbuttoned coat but also made it about someone that she loves who's no longer here and i remember hearing somebody speak at an event I was at. He was talking about sitting on a crowded, sweaty upper deck of a London bus on a rainy day when the bus is too warm on the inside and the window's all messed up and you can't see out. And it's all... And he, mm -hmm. he was talking about um, really complaining to himself about this. And then he thought, goodness, if I were dead mm -hmm. and I had a chance of even a second of life, I'd choose this. I'd be on the sweaty bus as opposed to nothing. I'd have it gladly, very gladly. And it sort of changed his whole, his whole sense. And that sense that, um, that the death and the finiteness of our lives can also be part of reminding ourselves. And it, it made me think when you were talking about Aretha, that one of the myths of the kind of self-improvement that we're talking about the sort of, I'm going to make myself shinier, better, I'm going to become a better person in every way and appear better every day, you know, that kind of... I think one of the one of the myths is, first of all, we imagine that there are people who have escaped the physical mm -hmm. mess of life. And we think about Aretha or anyone else who's famous, we think of billionaires or celebrities or, you know, film stars or uh, I don't know who else, captains of business or authors or, you know, we, we've got these stories about spiritual gurus and what we imagine is that they've escaped somehow they've escaped life they've escaped mm -hmm. the ordinariness of life and in doing so i think we also think that they've escaped death and in, in other words they're not going to have to face these people are just not going to have to face any of the messy mucky complicated difficult confusing downright discombobulating imperfectness of life that somehow they've transcended it and it's it's wonderful to have a poem like Marie's and then to have a, an interview with Aretha to go, nobody escapes it. Nobody escapes it. And when we know that, then it gives us a chance to come back. It, it gives us a chance to consider dropping the comparison, mm -hmm. which is not the same as dropping our wish to wash the dishes or fix the sink or find a way to take care of somebody we love better when we've got in a kerfuffle or a difficulty with them or it's not different from seeing if we can be kinder or more courageous or it's not it, it it's not opposite to that but it is different to imagining somehow that we're gonna transcend life itself and uh, get ourselves out of the gravitational pull of the ordinary and then when we remember that, maybe even the, the drainage system that won't work and the dishes in the sink and the plumber I haven't called, instead of being a, a, a source of adding on suffering to ourselves because we're comparing ourselves with some imagined life of perfection that nobody ever, ever, ever in the history of the world ever actually got to lead, maybe instead of doing that, we get to appreciate what's and in a way enjoy what's here uh around us and in front of us in a way that we we never could if we're always caught up in the comparison what would it be to enjoy the pile of crusty dishes it seems it seems odd to say but even just 
being here with them and knowing that at some point I'm going to wash them up when I get to it. And look at me, there I go again, I've dropped the bag of groceries in the street and on one hand it's very frustrating, on the other hand I'm alive to drop a bag of groceries in the street and it's very, very ordinary and everyone else is in it. Sort of that that sense of, um, what's the word, of um, maybe what I'm reaching for is when we, when we realise, as Marie Howe's reminding us, that we're all finite, that we all live and die, that we all live right in the middle of the mess of things, it also collapses the hierarchy of value between us, that we don't have to go, I'm not valuable and you are because you've got this together life. We actually start to treat ourselves and everybody as if they are in, of inherent value because we're starting to treat everything as if it's of inherent value rather than escaping in our minds to a fantasy a fantasy future that's never going to come in which all the difficulty and all the complexity goes away. I was just thinking just in one of the perils that I can see for me of thinking there are some people whose lives are shiny and fine and some people's who, who are you know who don't have that in, in my perception is that I can often leave people alone if you know what I mean if I think they're just fine and I'm noticing that the just fineness is not a reason to back off and to to give people less of a chance to say hello or have a chat or whatever the connection point is. And when you just talked about the kind of, you know, valuing all of us as, as the same, I was just thinking how that really helps to address the kind of fear I have sometimes of the shiny people, you know, the people who look like they've just, I think I've spoken on here before. I used to have a neighbor who had three children and they were always immaculate and they always had a bike helmet each, a pair of socks each, a perfect outfit with no food all over it. And she didn't have any sick on her or anything. And and I had one child at the time and I was literally completely <laughs> disheveled. And one of those people whose child looks reasonably all right, but I would, you know, look down and have something on my top that I hadn't realized was there and my, my hair all over the place or whatever. And I remember thinking, well, there's nothing that that person could possibly need from me. So I'm just going to stay really quiet and not really say anything and not be myself. And and I, I don't know whether there was anything that she needed or anything like that, but it stopped me being very connected to her. It stopped me being somebody who really asked how she was, really, because I thought that she looked like everything was just fine and she didn't need a conversation about anything or to connect in any way. So I'm seeing that there's a way that my kind of comparison dynamic alienates me from people where I think that they're perfect or something. And of course, I know that that's not true. You know, I really do. And and I'm feeling really strongly here the, the equalising nature, the ordinarizing nature of this invitation for Marie Howe to know that everybody's however much money we have however great things look however successful we perceive people to be like all of that there's still the kerfuffleage going on in everybody and it's it's really important to remember that whatever we're projecting onto people the ordinariness is just really what the living do is the truth of it and I'm really grateful to to feel softer towards the world and every single one in it because this is the nature of it this is what we're all up to is doing our best to probably not have the shop shopping bags split in the street and not be um you know too caught up in the craziness of whether the dishes have been done or not. And that's what we're all doing. This idea of softness towards the world, Lizzie, and maybe maybe one of the things that happens is that when we get softer towards one another and towards the world, 
something kinder in us comes out. Mm. You know, when we're less grasping, there's, there's, I want to keep on making this distinction, there's reaching to improve things, which the world really needs, always. Let's find ways, let's find ways to have people have grocery bags that don't split in the streets, that would be good, wouldn't it? Like, there are things we can make better. But if we can come at the world with softness and appreciation for things just as they are as well, in a way, and for people just as they are, I think it gives us much more chance to meet your neighbour in the midst of her actual life and then respond, rather than, as you're saying, you could find yourself holding back, keeping away. And it made me, it made me think was, <clears throat> I'm thinking a bit whilst we've been talking about I don't know why this it came to me this way, but I was thinking about the news. I was thinking about what's the news, and there's the news that we read of the, you know, and it's in one way it's important to read of things that are happening in the world. Right? But but there's the news when I say to you, what actually happened this morning, Lizzie? And you tell me about the kerfuffles of getting up and who slept and who didn't and getting everyone dressed and everything. That's the news. Because that's, that's actually what's happening day to day. And if we allow ourselves, it's really interesting. It's really important. And when we let ourselves care about one another, I want to know what happened between the moment you opened your eyes and, and, and how you got to sit here with me. It's, it's easily as important, maybe much more important than sitting and reading about some big world event important as that is too so i don't want to deny one from the other but maybe when what we're trying to do in our minds is we're comparing with some imagined life and we're leaping over our lives or or like you said you've got a comparison about a neighbor about what kind of life she has and somehow it makes her, her life inaccessible to you when we stop leaping over all of that and actually treat all of it as real and important and frankly it is i was thinking when you were talking about um getting children ready and out of the house. Uh, I was thinking about everything it takes to do that. And I don't just mean everything it takes in the middle of your life or my life right now. I also mean all the generations who came before us and people who built houses and people who made systems, the people who made the streets. And, you know, it is actually completely miraculous that any of this is possible. And we could treat that instead of leaping over it, we could we could treat it like it's and then that would bring us I'm so touched by this softness. And I was thinking about also I'm reading um a book on conversation at the moment by our friend Rob Poynton, which I'll probably bring a source from. And there's a point where Rob says in this book, How about when you're on the train, just strike up a conversation with somebody who's near you and find out about their lives? Like we hold ourselves, many of us hold ourselves at a distance. We've got all these projections and imaginings about somebody else's life. And we could bridge that gap and we could say, how was your journey? You know, how did you get here? <laughs> Tell me about your day before you got on the train. And it, it's an incredibly enlivening and human conversation. And it can leave us, as Marie House says, it can leave us speechless with appreciation and gentleness towards one another. I think that way we'd be a lot less hard on ourselves and we'd be a lot less unwittingly hard on one another. I'm also thinking, Justin, of the all the things that I do to have you think I'm fine. So I'm particularly, I have teenage nieces and nephews and particularly feeling a lot about social media at the moment and what everyone has access to and what they are up to with their own image projection into the world and absorbing others and all that stuff. And this whole dynamic of us posting the best, best of ourselves online and how that's the other side of this dynamic is that it's an invitation for people not to check in that we're all right, because what we're posting is we're just fine. Like there's a, there's a, there's a huge big gap between what we're putting out there and what's actually really going on. And that keeps people away. You know, I can see that if I only present the shiny moments of myself, it 
leaves people unable to be in relationship with me in the way that I've been saying that I find it hard to be in relationship with people when I think everything's just fine. So I'm also in this moment really curious about all the ways that I do that. I mean, not particularly, I don't post things on social media, but I, I walk around the street in a certain way. You know, I, I wonder about the kind of openness and warmth that can be there in a London street. When, as you say, like probably what Rob Poynton's pointing to as well is that in places like London, where there's public transport systems and everybody goes into these strange modes where everyone's completely, including me, everyone's completely not really themselves, that kind of closed down, completely insular, doesn't smile at anybody or say good morning or hello, just gets on with the thing. And this dynamic of having people stay further away because of the way that I'm being or what the image that I'm projecting is suddenly super interesting to me in this conversation because there's a way that I, I'm wandering around saying everybody stay away and there's a way that I could wander around saying who wants a chat? I'm thinking of my granddad now who used to go, go around and literally say hello to every single person he saw in the street when we were out. And I remember being a teenager going, oh my God, I can't believe you just did that. And if somebody didn't say hello, he'd tap them on the shoulder and say, oh, sorry, I think you missed me. I just said hello to you. <laughs> and um, I'm just thinking of that kind of world that is really excellent when someone says hello. It's a real wonder. And it's not really a given these days. And it's lovely. So, yeah, I'm I'm really curious about the way that we all are being that either invites people in or keeps people at bay unconsciously and not really realizing the way that we're doing that. What well, a wonderful place for us to end, Lizzie, to wonder about together about how we might be saying hello to one another and to everyone and wonder about the ways in which we might be signaling stay away. A rich and deep conversation, a joy to be uh, living in this moment with you, Lizzie, and with all of you who are here, who are here with us. Thank you for being with us. Um, we will be back next week. And a little reminder that if you want to support us, uh, if you find these conversations powerful or moving or important, head over to Turning Towards Dot Life, and there's a little support us button. You can metaphorically buy us a coffee, and you can. Uh, Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and those kinds of places as well. That helps. Or maybe just um, tell people you love who you think would benefit from being in this conversation with us. Tell them about it. Send them a link to the podcast or something. Thank you all for being with us. And um, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.